All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're doing a recording now to review for the concepts for our next test, which is going to be on Thursday, uh, February the 3rd. And so it's really important to watch the recording all the way through and practice all the questions on it. Also remember that it's going to be, the test is going to be on lessons 13 to 19 as well as the review material from lesson 21. Uh, the review material from lesson 21 is very important, so please go through that really carefully. All right, so let's get started, guys. Um, we're going to talk at this point just about the fact that water exists in different states. Right? In some places in the world, we have water in ice and icebergs. In other places, it's fresh water, such as streams and rivers. And then also, we have uh, water that's in lakes. Uh, but salt water is found in oceans, of course. And when you look at this diagram here, you can see that actually most of the water that's found in the Earth is salt water rather than fresh water. Only a very small amount is fresh water. Now, when we're talking about salt water, another word for that is salinity. And the amount of salinity, the amount of salt that's in ocean water is just a small amount, actually. It's about 3.5%. The rest of it is water. Okay. So we're just going to answer some questions based on the material we just went over. Uh, most of the water on planet Earth is, as we mentioned, salt water. And question number two, the percentage of salt that's in water is 3.5%. So moving along, we'll get to the next page here. Um, sorry about that, guys. I'll just give it a second and I'll get going again. Okay, my apologies, guys. Uh, so now, even if we have salt water, we can make it into drinkable water. It's possible to take the salt out. And there's two different ways we can do this. We can either use distillation equipment or something called reverse osmosis. And when you think about what distillation is, uh, basically, it's boiling water to leave the salt behind. And so what you can do, actually, uh, you can boil the water away if you have some salt in the water. And then if you just think about what happens when you've got something cold, like a, a cold uh, glass, uh, you know, for instance, a window pane that's cold or a glass of cold water, if there's steam in the air, it's going to form water on the outside of that glass, the cold glass of water, right? And that's what distillation is going to do, actually. And so that's the way that you get the water back. You boil it, and then you cool it down, and then it gets just the water, and you separate that from the salt. And so reverse osmosis is another way of doing it. If you remember what osmosis is, it's when you have a whole bunch of particles, and they bump into each other. So you go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Reverse osmosis is the opposite. And in this process, water moves from a low concentration of water to an area of high concentration. And as a result, it leaves the salt behind. OK, so uh, question three here says, the two methods of removing salt from water are distillation or reverse osmosis. OK, so as you can see, we've got a picture of some people here in a third world or developing country. A lot of those countries, unfortunately, they lack pure water. And they also lack a, a water distribution system. So that's a method of pipes and things like that that allows them to distribute the water from where it's found to where it's needed. Now, remember that word that explains when water is safe to drink? That's this word right here, potable water. That's what we call safe to drink water. Um, now, water is uh, we use it for a lot of different purposes, right? We use it for domestic purposes, industrial purposes. When you're talking about domestic use of water, that's basically personal use. So whether you're cooking or cleaning with it, those are all examples of domestic uses of water. Um, another thing that we do is sometimes we use irrigation, which is large amounts of water, 
uh, and we bring the water to dry areas where it's needed. For instance, if you go to the Okanagan of BC, you'll see a lot of irrigation going on, these big uh, irrigation pipes that pipe out the water. And uh, so there's a lot of benefit to that, of course. You're able to grow crops where you might not be able to grow them otherwise. But there is a downside to irrigation as well. Unfortunately, what it causes is uh, salt to grow, or to collect in the soil, rather. And uh, so then the soil becomes too salty. So it just kind of sticks around in the soil. Okay, so we have a question here. Number four, it says many third world countries lack a proper distribution system to take water from where it's produced to where it's needed. Question five, water that is drinkable. Again, that's called potable water. And question six, water used for personal use is domestic water. Okay, so again, that's cooking and cleaning, that sort of thing. All right, and a drawback to using water for irrigation is the accumulation of salts that just stick around on the ground. Okay, now it might sound kind of funny that we can talk about hard water and soft water. That sounds really weird, eh? Um, I know in some parts of southern Ontario, like uh, Kitchener, where my parents live, there's a lot of hard water, and they actually have to use these devices called water softeners to soften up their water. Again, I know it sounds really strange. So what is hard water exactly? Well, it's water that has a lot of minerals in it, and specifically the minerals we're talking about are calcium and magnesium. Uh, so now how are you going to know if water is too hard or maybe too soft? Well, water that's too hard, there's two things we know about it. One, it won't form any soap bubbles. So if you're in a place like Kitchener and you don't have a water softener, it might be hard for you to wash your hair because you can't get any soap bubbles there. Um, so that's one of the things about hard water. The other thing is because it's got all that calcium and magnesium in it, the calcium tends to build up something called scale, and that scale forms on the inside of pipes, as you can see right here. And so you've got less of a, an area for water to flow through, and so the, uh, the, water, can, the water flow can just kind of uh, uh, diminish and, and reduce all the way because of that scale it forms. Okay, so a couple questions here. This one, question eight, hard water has the min minerals, remember it's calcium and magnesium. And this question here, uh, hard water does not allow soap bubbles. And also we saw that with hard water, it also forms scale on the inside of things like pipes or even kettles, that sort of thing. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit at this point about water treatment. And uh, these are showing some of the steps in water treatment. We're not going to go through all these, but basically what you see at these early steps is you're filtering out larger and larger amounts of gunk and sediment, right? So filtration is what happens first. Well, first of all, of course, you test the water to see what it's like. Then you filter it. And then after that, you purify it or disinfect it. So that's what's happening here. And you can see the chlorine is being used. Okay, so filtration is the first step, and then purification. Okay, so again, first we test the water. Then we take out the large solid material, like dirt or whatever, and that's known as filtering. And after we filter it, again, we purify it. So you can see the steps here. Test, filter, purify. Okay, so in this blank here, after water is tested, then it is filtered, and then last of all, purified. Okay, so what exactly are we needing to do when we purify water? Well, we want to kill any organisms that are in the water that could cause disease. And for that, we use chlorine. So, of course, you think about when you go to a swimming pool, there might be a lot of chlorine there added to the water. So, again, that's going to kill any disease-causing organisms. Okay, that's great. But there is a downside to using a lot of chlorine. And this is a downside that happens if you use it for long periods of time. It could potentially cause cancer. Now, we talked about the fact that bacteria is sometimes found in the water. That's something we want to kill. 
Uh, one type of bacteria that's very common with disease that we need to get rid of is something called E. coli. And there's something called hamburger disease. Uh, this was a little more common a few years ago. The reason you could get hamburger disease is because meat is chopped up really fine. And so because of that, the meat's uh, surface area is exposed more to the environment. And that's why you could possibly get hamburger disease. But again, that's associated with cooking it not enough. As long as you cook hamburger enough, it's unlikely you're going to get that. Okay, so let's look at these uh, questions here. Chlorine is used to control disease causing organisms in the water. Number 12, using chlorine in the water may unfortunately lead to cancer. But again, that's large amounts over long periods of time. Uh, question 13, E. coli is a type of bacteria which causes disease. All right, now, uh, just like people have different stages of their life, uh, so does a river, right? And you can look at these different stages here in the diagram, youth, maturity, old age, rejuvenated. Okay, so how does that work now? Well, in the younger stages of a river, you just think about it, a river might often start in the mountains. So because it's starting up so high, uh, it's traveling really fast, right? So because it's traveling fast, it travels in a straight line. Later on, as it gets to the mature stage, the land is flatter. So because it's flatter, it kind of winds around, right? And it travels more slowly. Now, the beginning of a river is a source and the end is its mouth. And often at the end of the river, you get a lot of dirt and rocks that have been carried along by the river and then they're deposited as the river starts to slow down. These deposits can sometimes be called a delta. So if they form like a fan-shaped deposit found at the mouth or in other words the end of the river, that can be a delta. Okay, so let's look at these questions here. At the beginning stage, a river flows at a very fast speed. Again, it's up high in the mountains and in a straight line. Later on, it's winding around. Okay, so dirt and rocks are deposited at the mouth of a river and this can form something called a delta. Now, I don't know if you guys remember what a floodplain is, but that's just an area, it's a plain, where a lot of the water from a river has spilled over. Okay, so if there's a flood, the area where the water spills over is a floodplain. That kind of makes sense, right? Now, we know there are a few rivers in Alberta that are found around Edmonton and Calgary, uh, but most of them are actually found in areas that are far away from Edmonton and Calgary. So the question here, the place where a river overflows onto the banks is a flood plain. And that kind of makes sense. It's flooding and so the area is called the flood plain. Okay, now we're going to talk about the rocks of the earth, uh, what causes different formations on the earth to be formed. And you can see this picture here. Uh, some of the formations that are formed in the ocean. So we know that the Earth's crust is made up of these giant plates and these plates are moving compared to each other. Here's two plates. Now plate tectonics is the name given to the movement of the Earth's rock plates. But what is it that causes these plates to move back and forth? Well, you've got this liquid rock, this magma that's underneath, and you've got these convection currents. And you, do you remember what convection currents are? You can have them in the air, you can have them in the water. Well, whenever you have a situation where you've got heat, uh, heat is going to travel upwards and then it's going to cool down and then as it falls, it's going to continue around in a cycle of heat and cold, heat and cold, and that's called a convection current. So those convection currents are actually what causes those rock plates to move back and forth. Okay, so question 17, plate tectonics is what refers to the movement of Earth's plates, and it is the convection currents under the rock plates which actually causes them to move back and forth. 
And as we'll see, when they move, it causes different structures within the ocean or within, within the Earth, on the Earth's surface. Okay, so one of the things that can happen is when rock plates move together, it can form mountains. Okay, so the rock plates move together and kind of push upwards at the point where they meet. Okay, so this question here, plate tectonics may involve plates moving together, which sometimes forms mountains. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the formations that are formed at the bottom of an ocean because of rock plates. We have these things called mid-ocean ridges. Okay, so these here are formed as molten rock or magma flows between two rock plates to form a ridge. Okay, so just think about the fact that uh, rock plates are involved in molten rock. So think about rock and ridge. Molten rock flowing up, and that's what causes the ridge. Uh, there's also something called a continental shelf. Okay, so here's the continent. Here's the continental shelf, and it's found near the land at the bottom of the ocean. So it makes sense that it's called the continental shelf because it's always found near the land, in other words, the continent. Okay, so let's look at a few questions. Uh, Mid-ocean ridges are formed when magma flows between the two rock plates on the ocean floor. And this one here, a continental shelf is always found close to the land. In other words, the continent. Okay. Now, you remember that as glaciers in the past, or even now in the present to some extent, uh, they're like a river of moving ice, and when they move over the land, they can shape the land as they pass over it. So you might remember that an esker is like a snake-shaped hill, whereas a drumlin is like a teardrop-shaped hill. Okay, so how are you going to remember the difference between those? Well, you might remember for one thing that esker has an S in it, so S for snake-shaped. Uh, you must, might also just think about having a pet named esker, pet snake named Esther, es no, Esther, sorry, Esther. And uh, for instance, you might remember that uh, if your brother is drumming too loud, it might make you cry. So drumlins are teardrop shaped. Kind of unlikely, but hey, we use whatever we can to remember something, right? Okay. So again, Esther snake shaped, drumlin teardrop shaped. Okay, so this question here says an Esther is a formation that is snake shaped. Okay, so we talked before about the fact that mountains are a process of plate tectonics. In other words, those giant plates moving together and pushing up. So mountains are a result of plate tectonics, uh, but hills are a result of those mountains being eroded away. So for instance, forces like wind and rain cause those mountains to be eroded eventually into hills. Okay, so uh, we can talk about weathering. For instance, wind and rain cause weathering. They cause rocks to be worn away. But there's another kind of weathering as well. So it really doesn't have to do with the weathering. Weathering is just talking about rocks being worn away. Uh, and another way it can happen is a result of chemicals. So for instance, you get carbon dioxide that's in the air when it dissolves into water in the air it forms carbonic acid. Sorry, guys. I always, always forget to uh, take the phone away. Anyways, so this carbonic acid is what can wear away at the rocks. And so again, it, this acid eats away at the rocks. And again, this is called chemical weathering. So the question here says the process of erosion changes mountains into hills. 
And again, carbonic acid is responsible for chemical weathering. So if you just think about C, chemical, C, carbonic acid. All right, so now remember there's acids and then there's bases. They're kind of the opposite, right? Now alkaline is just another name for a base. And some lakes that we have are alkaline instead of acidic. So what causes the alkaline that's in those lakes? Well, uh, there's two different kinds of chemicals. Carbonate or bicarbonate can cause alkaline lakes. Uh, if you have baking soda, that's basically bicarbonate. Okay, so that's what causes alkaline lakes. And uh, carbonic acid, of course, causes acidicate lakes. All right, so. Acidic lakes really come from pollution, but alkali lakes don't come from pollution. Again, they come from either carbonates or bicarbonates. So this question here, alkaline lakes have, we could say, carbonates in them, or we could say bicarbonates, rather than carbonic acid. <coughs> okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more of this thing called acid rain. Acid rain is not good, of course. It eats away at things. Um, and where does it come from? Again, from carbonic acid. So now some people think that if you're going to have acid rain, you're going to be able to tell just by looking at it, but you actually can't. Acid rain actually looks quite clear. So again, remember air pollution is what causes it. Now the really important thing to notice is that the diversity of living things in the water is going to go down. In other words, creatures living in the water, fish or whatever, they don't like acidic conditions. They want things to be more like neutral. And so because of that, the diversity or the number of living things goes down as a result of acid rain. So this question says acid rain results in lower diversity of creatures in a body of water. All right, so now we're going to look at how water affects climate. So what is climate again? Well, we know weather is the short-term conditions, you know, what you see in the newspaper for what's going to happen on Thursday and Friday, whereas climate is kind of like the weather that's observed for a long period of time. Now remember, when we talk about large bodies of water, they moderate climate, right? So we think about Vancouver. Vancouver's climate is never too cold or too hot. And that's what we talk about, a moderated climate, and so it's because of the fact that you have a large body of water. So remember, you can't just have a little pond nearby that's going to change the weather system. It has to be a large body of water. Okay, why is it that water affects the temperature of the land in places like Vancouver? Well, it has to do with the fact that water takes a longer time to heat up and a longer time to cool down than the land does. So question 27, climate is the weather that occurs over a long period of time. Question 28, only large bodies of water can moderate climate, something like a puddle can't. Question 29, water takes a long time to heat up and a long time to cool down. Okay, so. I don't know if any of you guys are from Bonnie, Scotland. Um, anyways, this question here is talking about Scotland and Newfoundland. My wife is from, she's, some of her ancestors are from Scotland. I love the accents over there. Um, anyways, um, now the interesting thing is both Scotland and Newfoundland, if you look on a globe, their latitude is about the same. And normally places that have similar latitude, the temperature is about the same. But Scotland is actually warmer than Newfoundland is. Well, why is that? It has to do with the fact that the water currents that flow by Scotland come from the equator, whereas the ones that flow by Newfoundland come more from the, the North Pole. Okay, so that's why Scotland is warmer. Now, do you remember what causes these ocean currents to form in the ocean? There's two different things that cause ocean currents. One is the winds. And the second is temperature differences. So just like we saw before with uh, convection currents, when you have uh, water flowing from 
becoming warmer and rising and then cooling down and you get this cycle going on. It's kind of the same thing that's going on in oceans as well. So water moves from areas of hot water to areas of cool water. And that again is what causes ocean currents. All right, well years ago they had a situation going on where some parts of the world were really affected by dramatic changes in temperature. And this was due to something they called El Nino. And you were hearing about it a lot in the news those days. Uh, news, um, sorry, um, El Nino brought two different kinds of conditions. Warm weather and wet weather. So just remember two W's. Whereas another thing called La Nina uh, produced cool weather. So the opposite sort of situation. Okay, so question 30, the ocean currents that run by Scotland are warm, uh, warmer than the ocean currents that pass by Newfoundland. 31, the cause of ocean currents, we have two things, wind and temperature differences. And qu question 32, unlike La Nina, El Nino brings warm and wet weather. So again, two W's. Okay, now remember we talked about the different zones of a lake that, you know, the type of life forms that you find in a lake are actually quite different. So we can see that there are plants growing at the shallow end of a lake. Now why can they only grow there? Well that's because these are the only areas where light is able to penetrate. In the deeper areas of the lake, light is not able to penetrate and so because of that you don't find plants in those deeper areas of the lake. What you do find in all areas of the lake though are fish because they can grow in all different areas. Okay, so question 33, only fish live at the deeper levels of the lake. Okay. Now when we think about uh, different creatures living in different environments, such as for instance creatures living uh, in, on rocks that are in an ocean where the waves are going really furiously, uh, you know, something like a barnacle has suction cups, you know, so it's perfectly adapted to living in that sort of environment. So an adaptation is basically something about the way the creature is made that makes it well suited to living in the environment that it lives in. So that's what an adaptation is. Um, now, if you think about the different situations uh, creatures could live at in an ocean, uh, some creatures are well adapted to high pressure conditions. And those are deep in the water, the pressure is going to be really high, right? Okay, so question 34, an adaptation is a physical characteristic or it could be a behavior that makes you well suited to a certain environment. Question 35, deep in the water the pressure is quite high, right? Because you have all that water up above you, so it's, it's a lot of pressure. Okay, so sometimes the situation in an animal's uh, living environment changes. So for instance, the food supply goes down, that might be one sort of possibility. Now, when that happens, so when there's a change in the environment, there's going to be a change in the population numbers. So the population numbers are going to go up or down, depending on what kind of change it is. So some types of changes in the environment are short-term changes, while other ones are long-term. So what would be an example of a short-term change? Well, if uh, there's a little bit more rain all of a sudden, that would be an example of a short-term change. But on the other hand, if uh, people were to come along and dam a river, that would be a long-term change, wouldn't it? So with a short-term change, conditions are going to go back to normal as soon as the rains return, right? Okay, so question 36, when a population changes due to the amount of rain in an area, this is a short-term change. Okay, what do we have here? Well, we have a picture of something called an estuary. What is an estuary? It's an area where fresh water from a river 
mixes with salt water from an ocean. Okay, so the, this question here, the place where fresh river, <laughs> river water meets salty ocean water is called an estuary. Okay. Now, you guys have probably seen a pond where there's a lot of green muck in it. Well, those are usually algae that's growing in the, the lake or pond. And what causes it to grow? Well, what happens is usually when there's some sort of uh, fertilizer, for instance, some sort of uh, you know, waste or something that's added to a body of water that's got a lot of nutrients in it, it causes the algae to grow. Now, what happens then is when the algae grows, uh, there's less Sorry, I just got to get the door. Be right back. Okay, so when the algae grows, less light is able to get into the water, right? So because less light can get into the water, fewer plants can grow. And uh, because plants produce oxygen, there's less oxygen in the water. And then eventually plants and animals die off because of the lack of oxygen. Okay. Now, another thing that can happen to water is uh, sometimes you've got factories or plants producing a lot of pollution. Uh, but this is a different kind of pollution because sometimes when they put hot water into the water, that's called thermal pollution. So because thermal is kind of like another word for heat, that's called thermal pollution. And a lot of fish don't like hot water, and they tend to die. Okay, so again, thermal pollution is a result of hot water. Okay, question 38. Algae will grow where fertilizers are added to water because these chemicals add nutrients. Okay, so again, that's what causes them to grow. Question 39, factories often pollute water by heating it. And this is known as thermal pollution. Again, thermal is just another word for heat. So now, there's two causes of oil and chemicals in the water. One of them is oil spills. Of course, that's been happening actually a fair amount these days. And uh, of course, we know what the result of that is. You see all these birds that are covered in oil and they can't fly and that sort of thing. It's kind of sad. Uh, the other thing is runoff. So that's what happens when, for instance, there is uh, oil uh, from farmers' fields or from the streets and it runs into the rivers and lakes. So again, the main two causes of oil and water are oil spills and runoff. Okay, so the last point I just want to make to you guys uh, you know, some people think that science can solve all the problems that exist out there, and you know, good thing is it can solve a lot of them, but it can't solve everything. You know, it, it takes people, it takes the public getting involved as well to solve problems that are out there. Okay, so guys, we've gone through it, and uh, I want to encourage you guys to continue to practice the questions on here until you can get them. Uh, again, lessons 13 to 19, as well as the review material are really important to preparing for the next test that's going to be on Thursday, February the 3rd. I want to wish you guys an awesome weekend. I hope it goes great for you guys. And uh, thanks for listening. Have a great day. Take care and God bless.